my uh, my son just left Hawaii and is currently in Peru. The other day we had Hawaiian pizza. I was cooking it and I burnt the Hawaiian pizza and I realized I should have cooked it on Aloha temperature. No? Fine. I, uh, a while back, I uh, w- went on sabbatical. I, I read through the entire Old Testament and just fired through it in about four and a half months, um, not really studying it, just kind of reading it for myself, digging into it, uh, praying my way through it. Um, but I really loved the story arc that you begin to see in it over and over and over again when you see it. It's like God absolutely loves us, completely loves us, want to shower us with our blessing, but loves us enough in order to choose him or not choose him. And and oftentimes the Israelites would not choose him. And then it would go really bad for them for a season. And then they would get smart and they go, oh no, we need to actually like follow God again. And it would go really well for a little while and then they would not choose him. And then just see this over and over and over again in the Old Testament. This, this arc of, oh man, oh. Ah, ah. You start getting so frustrated watching these Israelites once again do stupid stuff. And then you realize, oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> I do that all the time. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, then I began, I got finished through it, the Old Testament. I spent a ton of time really digging into Matthew. I'm not sure how many of you have spent a ton of time really digging into the gospel of Matthew. It was written by Matthew, also known as Levi. He was a, a tax collector in Jesus' time, and then he uh, spent some spent some time with Jesus for about two and a half years and uh, saw some amazing things happen in his lifetime. Um, uh, He gave a a meticulous and ordered account uh, about the life of Jesus from a a firsthand perspective because he spent time with Jesus. And and I began to study it out and break it out and and really felt like we were supposed to uh, do a good job as a church of introducing people to Jesus. And, and what I'd like to do is enter into a long chew into the book of Matthew. Uh, over the next little while, we are going to, uh, verse by verse, work our way through the entire book uh, so that we can ha- get a full perspective of what it is that this follower of Jesus felt about Jesus. Um, so we're, we're, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to be spending a, a little bit of time uh, uh, digging into that over the weeks ahead. It's going to be called uh, Introducing Jesus, Who He Is, Why He Matters. If you've always maybe wanted to lo- know a little bit more about Jesus but haven't really dug into who he is and why it is that he matters, then man, this series coming up is going to be awesome for you. Um, woven all throughout the Old Testament is the talk of the the goodness of this king that is coming. Um, That in him and through him we have access to everything that God the Father wants for us. Not in religion and not in our desperate struggle to try to be gooder, um, but that in Jesus, as we connect with Jesus, that that there is something special that he wants to do in us and through us. Uh, Have you guys ever noticed that the superheroes of old, most of the superheroes wear masks. Uh, in film and in fiction, you know, guys like Spider-Man and Batman and, and, and Zorro all wear masks where you feel like you can't really get to know them. They, the world benefits from their kindness and their goodness. They, they save the world from the bad guys, but nobody really knows who they are in their world. Very few people anyways. They can't be known personally by everyone, authentically by everyone. And, and there's a sense that this could have been said about the God in the Old Testament. Where he was good and he was working on their behalf, but he didn't reveal himself fully to people, personally to people. We couldn't know him intimately. It was like he was behind a veil, behind a a mask. But when Jesus arrived on the scene, the veil was torn in two. Uh, He was unmasked, and we got a chance to really know God as he really is. This is why when Philip asked Jesus to show him God, uh, Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip? 
even after I've been among you for so long, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, God's plan is not to be our superhero. He wants to be more than that, more than somebody that we just call on in times of trouble. He wants to be a close and intimate friend. He wants to be our constant companion, our father, our, our guide. He wants us to know him personally, and he made that available to us through Jesus. He came to bring us everything. And we see this in Isaiah 61, as we just read. Sometimes we hear this verse read at Christmas time. Uh, quite a few times people like to read this at Christmas. It's a special text because Jesus kind of sent this message on to Isaiah hundreds of years in advance so that when he could arrive on the scene, he spoke one of his very first sermons from this text and said, okay, I'm done reading this. This is about me. You guys need to know that. Uh, so as we look at Isaiah 20, or 61, uh, we get a, a chance, a, a glimpse into what it is that Jesus is about, what it is that he wants to offer us. And, and there are some truly amazing things that God wants to offer us. Got to love it when the wind is blowing up there, eh? You hear it? Just bashing up there. Here's the first thing that I really hope that you understand is that Jesus came to help the troubled. Uh, I think I used to use this term troubled uh, for very few people, but I've kind of realized that this word trouble applies to, troubled applies to everybody. Uh, I used to think there were these people around me who had it all together, people who seemed to like, oh man, they got everything working for them. But the longer that I've lived on this earth, I've, I've just realized, realized we're all a little troubled. Uh, I believe uh, that I, I sometimes believed what it is that I saw on the surface of people's lives. Early on, I thought the external matched what it is that was really going on in the internal, but I've learned over the years that this just isn't true. The more I, I know people, the more I experience that I have, I realize that nobody has it all together, that we are all just a little troubled. Everyone deals with problems and hurts and difficulties to some extent. Everyone deals with, with problems and struggles and hidden things going on on the inside. We're all just a little bit guarded with e with each other. No one really has it all together, not on their own anyways. Now, I do know some people who live powerful, uh, victorious lives. It's not because they're so great. It's because they, they seem to have something inside of them. And, and I, I can say this, though, though certainly not all Christians, even Christian leaders, man, so many of those lately in the news, uh, they don't have it all together. I have seen some people who have this, and I, I'm going to use the term again, a victorious kind of attitude about them where they feel like there, there's something about them where they've conquered a bunch of things in their life or they've let God conquer a bunch of things in their life. And those people that I'm drawn to who have this kind of thing about them, almost always it's because they have this, they're a devoted follower of Jesus. There is this clinging of, that they have to Jesus. And, and today, I, I know I'm speaking to some troubled hearts in here. Uh, some of you are here today, you're struggling. Maybe you're struggling with inadequacies, inadequacies or you're struggling with your past, or you're struggling with cyclical behaviors that you just can't break. I want you to know two things. One, you are not alone. We're all in the same boat. We all sin. And two, Jesus came specifically, as we found out in this verse, to heal your hurts and give you victory over your troubles. Listen to what he said. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for the Lord has anointed. That means sent, commissions, commissioned him to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that the captives will be released and the prisoners will be freed. Now, everyone falls into one of those categories that I just mentioned there. Um, whether you are brokenhearted or captive or poor. I, I, you know, I've spent time ministering in the Dominican Republic. I've spent time in Zambia and Uganda. I've personally known some very poor people, uh, genuinely poor. They, they live in poverty beyond our ability to even imagine. And for them, Jesus is really good news because he strengthens them and he gives them hope. And I've seen this again and again, how God provides for people who are desperately poor and who put their hope in him. 
I've also known many people here in Canada whose lives are in such a financial mess that they are poor and they live with the same kind of fear, the same kind of desperation as the genuinely poor do. They may have six figures coming in, but they've got six figures and 20% going out. And so they live a poor lifestyle. They don't know how to stop the cycle. I've, I've been in this position. I know people who are currently in this position and it is a dreadful place to be. I want you to know that Jesus came to help in the midst of your struggles. Whatever the cause or the nature of your poverty, he cares. And if you, if you cling to him, he will help you reevaluate. He will help you reorganize your finances, your priorities. He'll provide for you in ways that you never thought were imaginable. He also came to, to help people find wholeness and healing in each of the areas of their life. He came to comfort the brokenhearted. Now, we've all had broken hearts at some point in our lives. There isn't a person here who hasn't been affected by a divorce or a betrayal or an unfaithfulness or a, a broken trust. Maybe if they haven't felt it personally, they've seen it in friends that they know or loved ones that they know when a, when a failed relationship of a parent happens or a close friend. You know what it is that it's like to have your heart broken. Jesus came to bind up that wound. How does he do it? His presence in your life is enough. If you'll give him more than just a nod, more than just a, hey, how you doing once a day kind of thing, more than just a wave every once in a while when you need him, if you will actually cling to him, he'll heal your broken heart. He came to provide freedom to the prisoners as well and the captives. He came to release people from darkness. Is there something in your life that's holding you captive? Are you a prisoner to addiction or maybe to fear or guilt? Maybe you're addicted to your calendar. <laughs> Jesus came to set you free from the power of the past over your life and a, a future of freedom. Um... Some of you are so stuck in a fear of the future that it's, it's keeping you a prisoner. How does he release you from it? His presence in your life is enough when you cling to him. Jesus came to help the troubled. That's why, that's why he matters. Also, Jesus came to replace the ugliness in your life. You know, Easter morning uh, last week was so beautiful. Thank you so much to everybody who, who came and helped. It was so cool. A nice reprieve from this spring winter that we've been having. It was so beautiful uh, on Sunday. It was beautiful today as well, thank goodness. Um, it was so weird that in the morning it was just so sunny, and then 12.30, here comes the snow pellets flying. Uh, it was wild. Some say it's been the coldest April on record in certain places. Uh, windy, overcast, and rainy, and snowy, and back and forth. I want to punch the April showers, bring May flowers, people, right in the throat. <laughs> I know, I guess there's still some ugliness in me that i got to work on. <laughs> My sister Colleen is a great painter. Uh, sometimes I wish that I could see the world through her paintings. Bright and colorful and cheery. Man, if we could just create a world as peaceful and serene as the world that we can create on a canvas, we probably wouldn't have a need for Jesus. We wouldn't have needed him to come into our lives. But the world that we've created, the one that really exists below the surface in most of us, is there's a little more ugliness than we would like there. There's a little more pain. It's, there's heartache and disappointment. There's failure and regret. This is, this is a world that we can't escape from on our own. The good news is that Jesus came to change the world. He came to turn, turn something ugly into something beautiful. He came to, to all who mourn. He, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. Oh man, I, I love reading these words. Maybe right now in your life all you see is ashes, but... Man, you need to know that there is a crown of beauty waiting for you. Maybe right now all you feel is a sense of mourning, a sense of loss, but I want you to know there is a, a joyous blessing that can come your way, an oil of gladness, some translations say, waiting to be poured out over you. Maybe there's a, a spirit of despair 
but I want you to know that God is waiting to clothe you with, with something different, a garment of festive praise, he calls it. In fact, man, some of you need to know that you, you can begin to experience that festive praise now in your life. Um, you, you might say, ah, you know what, I don't feel praise in my heart right now. Well, praise isn't about your feelings. You don't praise God by telling him how good you feel. You praise God by telling him what it is that he's done in your life and how good he is. Um, praise him and your feelings will change. Some of the gladdest people that I know in my life are people who have sung their way through some truly difficult things in life. You might say, well, I've got problems that haven't been solved yet. Man, put on festive praise now and watch how those problems will begin to fade in your life as God begins to make himself further known in your life. And the perception of your problems will decrease as your awareness of God increases in your life. This is one thing that you can do to literally change the way that you feel. I sang and praised my way through a stage four cancer diagnosis. Certain songs became rallying cries in my life. And, and fortunately, I got that healing, and, and that's amazing. But to be honest, during that season where I was just like actively clinging to Jesus and praising my way through all of these difficulties was some of the best times of my life. <laughs> Sometimes I go, man, why am I not continuing to just like cling to Jesus and praise my way through life? Because of that amazing thing that ends up happening inside of you. He, he, he replaces despair with gladness. He makes the ugly in me beautiful again. Verse 4, they'll rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They'll re revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. He's going to rebuild, he's going to repair, he's going to revive. He'll do this through you and in you. Maybe there are things in your life that you thought have been destroyed forever. Uh, no matter how much you've suffered, how much disappointment that you've felt, you've experienced uh, maybe disappointment over and over and over again. Maybe it's disappointment that you created or disappointment that somebody created for you. You need to know that God is ready to rebuild, repair, renew and revive you in your life. He wants to do something beautiful inside of you. He wants to replace what is ugly in your life with something beautiful. Listen to his words. Instead of shame and dishonor, you'll enjoy a double share of honor. You'll possess a double portion of prosperity in your land. And everlasting joy will be yours. Can you imagine that? Replacing shame and dishonor with a double portion of everlasting joy. How does he do it? I want you to know that just his presence in your life is enough when you cling to him. See, Jesus came to take away what's ugly in your life and replace it with something beautiful. Um, Jesus also came to make the joy last in your life. Jesus wants to do more than merely you know, paint on the surface of your life some kind of goodness. No, he wants to do something internal in you. He wants to, to make things new on the inside so that there's a joy that isn't affected by the things of life, a joy that bubbles up inside of you no matter what it is that's going on in the exterior. He wants to give you a good life based on a solid foundation that lasts from this day until the end of days. Notice it's an everlasting covenant that he wants to make with you. Jesus came into the world to change your life and make you new forever. That, that he's here to stay. And as we talked about last, last week, he will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He wants to give you, he wants to love you with an everlasting love. And there is nothing in this world that can get between you and God's love. Uh, Romans says, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God's covenant with you is permanent. His deal with you is permanent. This is joy. 
He goes on to say that after these great things are accomplished in your life, everyone will realize that there are a people the Lord has blessed. God wants to reveal his kingdom to all the earth. This means that he wants to reveal his glory in your life as he makes you into something beautiful. He wants your family to be amazed at the changes that are taking place in you. He wants people to realize that, that your life was turned around not by your own determination and a couple of good self-help books, but just as a result of God's presence in your life. That through his mercy, through his goodness, through the power of Jesus and him alone, he's changed you. How will he accomplish this? You, you've heard me say it enough now, you're probably getting sick of it, but just his presence in your life is enough. Cling to it. And I'm not talking about the casual acquaintance where you talk for 10 seconds a day. I'm talking about you being online all the time with him. Where you become aware of him in all of your everyday stuff of life. Where you cling to him with all that you've got so that you can give all that you've got as a result of everything that you're willing to let him give to you. Man. There's nothing more important than the presence of Jesus. I hope you connect with him. More than just connect with him, I hope you begin to cling to him and his presence. Talk to him every day. Talk to him throughout the day. Put on songs of praise or speak out your own songs of praise. Sing to him and, and tell of the marvelous works that he has done in the life to anybody who will listen. Ask him to fill your life with his presence and with a love that, and a peace that surpasses all understanding so that all of our problems, all of our hurts, all of our issues begin to fade in the goodness of God's living in and through us. As he heals our hurts and frees us from the issues that we currently have in our life because his presence in our life is enough to fill your every single need. That's who Jesus is. That's why he matters. Let's pray.